Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so, it's a pleasure to be welcoming back Sadipto Das, who is um, here as, a, as an intern working with us la um, a year ago. Um, and since then, he's been, been a busy guy. He's got papers published in all the top database conferences and, and several others. Um, Co-winner of a Best Paper Award at CIDR and um, Best Runner-Up at um, Mobile Data Management. Um, conference and, and um, has more work coming out in the pipeline. He certainly isn't going to have time to talk about all of that today, but, um, but he's going to tell us about some of his work on, on transactional record management um, for database systems. Thank you very much, Phil, for the nice introduction, and thank you all for coming. <clears throat> so as Phil pointed out, this is going to be just a sliver of uh, the work which I've done in the broad area of scalable data management. So this one focuses on scalable, consistent, and elastic database systems, and uh, the context I'm setting it is for the cloud platforms. So as many of us are aware, like over the past few years, uh, a lot more and more applications are being delivered over the web, over the network. Not only has this front end changed, this has also resulted a change in the back end infrastructure, what we often call as cloud computing. So in its simplest form, cloud computing is essentially cloud infrastructure or services provided or solutions provided as a service and it's already become a pretty big business and it's growing and some of the key factors to the success are the economies of scale and the notion of elasticity or paper use kind of pricing even though almost every aspect of computing can be provided as a service three paradigms have evolved as popular ways of uh, providing cloud service, namely infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, to all the way up to software as a service where your entire software comes as a package delivered over the cloud. Irrespective of which layer you are using or which abstraction you are using for the cloud, data is a central concept and DBMSs form a mission critical part of, a uh, mission critical component of the cloud software stack. They kind of serve petabytes of data, they manage petabytes of data, and more often than not, they drive the revenue of the company as well. And because of the wide variety of applications that are deployed in the cloud, they often have to deal with a wide variety of applications themselves, a term which we often refer to as multi-tenancy. If you consider the data needs of these applications, you can broadly divide into two different categories. On one, one hand, we have the OLTP systems, which are there to just serve data, small read-write transactions. And on the other hand, we have the data analysis systems that allow for decision support and intelligence. This is obviously a very like, simplified view of the world. In this talk, I'll be focusing on the transaction processing systems or the transaction processing aspect of uh, these databases. So if you think of the application landscape for this OLTP databases, what does it look like? It ranges all the way from social gaming to rich content to managed applications. And we have the cloud applications platforms as well that are growing in popularity like Windows Azure or App, uh, Google App Engine. And they have an OLTP database that is sitting behind the scenes serving all the applications. So yeah, as you can see, it's pretty rich and diverse. There are a large number of challenges that need to be solved for uh, designing such OLTP databases. In this talk, I'll just focus on three specific challenges. As we all know that the amount of data or the number of applications that are being served is growing every day. So scale is definitely a big problem. So these systems must be scalable, but because they, have, they are OLTP, they also must ensure that they are serving transactions efficiently or they are executing transactions efficiently. Elasticity is a big thing in cloud where it allows for the infrastructure to be provisioned on demand. And we want our databases that are deployed in the cloud to be elastic as well. That is, have the ability to scale on demand in a live system. And last but not the least, when you have a big system, you want it to be self-manageable, to reduce the no number of dollars you spend in uh, getting administrators for the system. So you want intelligence without a human controller. I'll get into the details of each of these challenges. So if you consider the challenge of scalability, there are classically two different approaches to scalability. One approach is scale up, where you throw more 
more powerful or uh, high capacity hardware and this is a uh, typically used in the classical enterprise setting where it was more convenient to scale up the databases and the relational databases are one of the popular examples that like scale up because the, the rich functionality that the relational databases support it's easier to scale them up rather than the other way around and the key idea here is that you still have even when you have a bigger hardware or a more expensive hardware you still have you limit access to a single node which is the key for efficiency and a good performance as well now obviously this is not a viable solution for the cloud where you want to leverage from the commodity hardware or the economies of scale that can be leveraged from commodity hardware in that setting you want to use a cluster of commodity servers to scale out or what we say scale out so the idea here is that you somehow partition your database, divide it up into smaller granules, and then spread it up into on a cluster of servers. So one of the systems that has taken it to the extreme is what we call the key value stores, where they broke down the database to the smallest possible granules of single key value pairs or rows, and then distributed it across a cluster of thousands of servers, or even geographies in many cases. But in order to do that, what they have done is to ensure scalability and to ensure the property that you want to have your transactions at a single node, they have limited the functionality and guarantees that, that is supported. There are a lot of limitations that are imposed. For this talk, I'll just focus on the aspect that these key value stores do not provide support for multi-row or multi-step transactions. Now, why is transactions a big deal? I think many of us in this room already know that, but just to give, uh, put you in context, why actually care about transactions? So if you think of a very simple application like a social network or social, any social application and there is a friend request that is accepted. So this results in updating to the friend lists of the two individual users. If you were in a world where the database system supported transactions, this is the code you would write as the application de uh, developer. So the key idea here is the simplicity and this is one of the main reasons why databases have been so popular over the last few or last two or three decades. On the other hand, if you were writing it on a key value store with limited guarantees, this is just a fragment of the code which you'll end up writing. Don't even bother reading it because there are a lot of corner cases that have been left out here. And this is what the application developer re-implements for every application it writes. So in, in summary, it, is, it gets too complicated to write. Uh, for the, it makes life of the application developer harder and harder to build on this, uh, uh, these kind of key value stores or the reduced consistency guarantees. So if you view it as two different axes, as scale out being the vertical axis and asset transactions being the horizontal axis, on one hand we have the relational databases that give good functionality and strong asset transactions, but are not very amenable to scale out. They do provide limited scale out. On the other hand, we have key value stores that give you scale out to probably thousands of nodes. So the challenge which I want to address is spanning are bridging the gap between these two systems because there is a lot of potential to be leveraged or a lot of potential to be exploited in the middle space by providing transactions at probably not the scale of thousands but probably at the scale of tens of nodes which spans a lot of different types of applications and it becomes even more critical for cloud platforms that often cater to a wide variety of applications. As I've already mentioned elasticity is a key thing in cloud. So Compared to classical enterprise setting where you have a statically allocated capacity, cloud allows you to provision your systems on demand. So the underlying infrastructure allows you to scale on demand. So we want the database systems to have this ability as well. So we want to have the database systems to be elastic as well as be lightweight in terms of providing the elasticity by not introducing a lot of overhead. And last but not the least, managing these systems is often a pain. Why is it so? Because as you go to scale, failures become a norm rather than being an exception. So recovering, detecting and recovering from these failures, coordination and synchronization between a cluster of these nodes, how do you provision these systems, how do you do capacity planning, and the laundry list essentially continues for what you want to do automated. So there is a quote from a famous open source system called Zookeeper that says, a large distributed system is essentially a zoo, and that's why you need a Zookeeper for automating a lot of these guarantees. Now to add to it, if you consider the cloud platforms, they are inherently multi-tenant. Multi so there is a conflict between the goals of the service provider that is trying to minimize its operating cost, as well as the performance guarantees that are given to the applications that are uh, designed. 
And the challenge is how do you design these self-managing systems by minimizing the need for a human controller in such systems. To this end, my dissertation makes the following contributions. To provide transactions at scale, I have designed two different systems that allow you to scale out on a cluster of commodity nodes while providing transactional access. So one of the systems called Elastras, it uses a static partitioning technique, while another system called GStore uses, uh, allows you to form the partitions dynamically on demand. To provide lightweight elasticity, I have proposed two different designs for two common database architecture. One design called Albatross give, provides you lightweight elasticity in a sh shared storage or a decoupled storage architecture. Zephyr, on the other hand, provides you lightweight elasticity in a classical shared nothing database cluster. And in the self-manageability front, I'm currently working on a design called Pythia that allows you to do workload characterization, what tenant placement, etc. how to automate these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of uh, things in a large database system. For the interest of time in this talk, I'll just delve deeper into two of these systems. And obviously, we can uh, talk offline about the rest of the papers. But before getting into the depth of uh, the two different papers, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to give an overview of the kind of work which I've done. So as I've already said, this talk and my dissertation focuses on transaction processing. On the other hand, if you consider analytics, I've also worked on a number of projects to support a different kind of analytics or richer analytics for the different type of data needs. And one of the projects called Ricardo, as an intern at IBM Almaden, I worked on a project that allows for statistical models to be built on terabytes or petabytes of data. Essentially, it's an integration between R or a statistics software and Hadoop as a data management software. I've also worked on a project for multidimensional data analysis to provide a scalable multidimensional index database system to support location-based services. And essentially, this is an architecture that allows you to ingest a lot of location updates which are coming from the mobile devices, as well as run analytics online in such a system so that you can build rich applications like recommendation systems on top of these systems. In a somewhat different product pro project, I've also worked on social network anonymization, that if you want to anonymize the edge weights in a social graph, how do you anonymize the graphs while preserving some of the properties? On the other hand, I've also, been, I've also worked on some of the projects that try to leverage novel hardware that is available and see how we can leverage that infrastructure or the new hardware to come up with better and more efficient uh, database architectures. So as an intern last year at MSR, I was working with Phil on the project HIDER that gives a scale-out database architecture, leveraging large amount of flash, uh, low latency in, uh, data center networks, and large amounts of RAM that is available. In a different context, in the context of data streaming applications, you have long-running queries, continuous queries. And in this paper, in the courts, we were exp exploiting how we can leverage multi-core architectures or the parallelism inherent to multi-core architectures to efficiently parallelize these continuous queries. And the, in, we also looked at a problem where we were looking at the same problem, but at a different hardware, which is a ternary content addressable memory, which is a, a hardware hash table, equivalent to a hardware hash table. So this is kind of the, uh, the work I've done as a PhD student with different collaborations. Now getting back to the main area, or main focus of the talk, how do we provide transactions while scaling out? So as I've already said, when you want to scale out to a large number of nodes, you have to somehow partition the database and then distribute the partitions across a cluster of nodes. I see a very quiet audience. If there are questions, please interrupt me. So uh, I've, uh, I want it to be more uh, like interactive. OK, so getting back to partitioning, there has to be a mechanism of statically partitioning the databases. And classically, what we use is what we call table level partitioning, where you partition every table ind individually, independent of each other. Classical, uh, like typical techniques are range-based partitioning or hash-based partitioning. This makes the system management pretty easy. But the, the challenge that arises is that because the data is not partitioned the way it is accessed, a lot of transactions end up accessing data from different partitions, often resulting in distributed transactions, which we all know is pretty expensive. So recently, what a trend has come up is 
to leverage the data access patterns to partition the database, what we call it partition the database schema itself or the groups of tables leveraging the access patterns. And the goal here is to co-locate data items that are frequently accessed together within the same transaction. So here I've shown two different approaches. One is where you are limiting the schema by providing a specific schema structure. Another is where you are exploiting the workload patterns to kind of partitioning. So this is work done at MIT. This is work done, uh, work done by me in one of our systems. And a similar kind of uh, schema pattern is also supported in Cloud SQL Server as well as Megastore, which are uh, other commercial systems. So if you consider this problem of scaling out, where you have statically partitioned the database somehow so that most of your transactions are within a single partition, this essentially what you have allowed is you have made your transaction processing easier. But when you are scaling out to a big system, you have to deal with all the set of distributed systems challenges that were listed in one of the earlier slides. And actually I have proposed, designed, and implemented a system called Illustras that, tells, that provides one way of solving these challenges. This is a talk in itself, but unfortunately I wouldn't be getting into the details of this system, <clears throat> but we can definitely talk offline on this. And there are a number of other systems that were developed concurrently as well. As I've said, Cloud SQL Server, which was a system that, uh, that uh, supports SQL Azure and Microsoft hosted services, Ex uh, Exchange Hosted Archive, and this was done at Microsoft. There is a project from Google, Google Megastore, that, um, that powers the Google App Engine, as well as a relation, an academic prototype from MIT called Relational Cloud. For this talk, I'll focus on a somewhat different problem, where instead of viewing the partitions to be statically formed, what happens if you form the partitions dynamically? So let's take a concrete example. That static partition leverages the idea that somehow the access patterns partition statically. What if access patterns change, and often rapidly? For example, there are a bunch of applications where we observe this pattern. For example, online gaming application, or other collaboration-based applications, or recently we also came across scientific computing applications where you get this kind of access patterns. I'll get into details of one of these applications later in the slides. As you can see, the access patterns are evolving. Obviously, it's not amenable to static partitioning, as in we are losing out on the benefit of statically putting data together by trying to limit most transactions to a single node. Because the access patterns are changing, you end up doing a lot of distributed transactions. So the question we wanted to answer is, how do we get the benefit of partitioning? when accesses do not statically partition. And we propose a solution which is one of the first solutions to allow that. So let us take this example of an online multiplayer game. We have a statically partitioned database somehow, doesn't matter how. Let us assume that it happens to be, uh, the data items happens to be one of the rows corresponds to player profiles. Here we have a player ID, the player's name, some kind of dollars associated with it, and et cetera, et cetera. Now we have a bunch of players that are uh, spread across uh, the static partitions, and these players together want to come and play a game, which is online. Now while the game is in progress, you want to execute transactions on, this, uh, on the bunch of player profiles who are part of this game. So ideally, you would want to co-locate these data items together at one node so that your transactions are local. But there is a problem. The thing is that players move from one game to another, they want to play with some set of friends and then move to another set of friends. So the, the, the data items on which you want transactions change with time. Similarly, players can try playing different games. There are a lot of games that come up in a social platform like Facebook. They want to move around between games. So essentially, these groups or partitions are dynamic. Do players ever want to play two games simultaneously with different players? I'll, the I'll get to that. <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. If Dave knows what, how to trick me. <laughs> But in addition, if your, if your game becomes popular, you also have to deal with the challenge of dealing with hundreds of thousands of these concurrent game instances or groups being, deleted, uh, groups being formed. So how do you deal with the scale problem in addition to the dynamicity? So to restate the problem statement, what we want is we want to have transactional access over groups of data items. And we want to avoid di doing distributed transactions in doing that. This is a pretty hard problem because the application is not trying to help me. So what I would suggest is I would expose an abstraction to the application to help me out. What I want is the applications to declare to me what are the data items on, it, uh, on which it wants transactional access. We call it the key group abstractions. 
I want the groups to be small, I will get into why. I want the groups to execute a non-trivial number of transactions as well, again I will get into why. And as I have said is these groups can be dynamic and formed on demand, so the applications can form a group as well as delete a group. And if you want to stretch your imagination to multi-tenant systems, you can view the groups to be dynamically formed tenant databases, where your tenant data is kind of in a shared table kind of distribution. Now how are we going to do it? As I have said, because the application comes in and says what are the arbitrary set of uh, data items, they can be distributed. What I am going to do is that as a first step, I am going to select one of these data items as a leader. The leader selection is, uh, can be arbitrary or can have a strategic decision as well. And once there is a leader is selected, what the followers do is the rest of the keys in the data in the group which are called followers transfer their ownership to the leader node so that all the read write access of the data items here are co-located at one node. The key idea here is that again we are now limiting the rest of the accesses to the group to a single node so that transactions can execute efficiently. So, yeah. So, the data is moved to a new node. Conceptually, only the ownership is moved, the read write access. The data is actually not moved. So, I will get into the details. To answer Dave's question is, as you have said that, because we are moving access to one node, what happens if groups are, have overlaps? If the overlaps are small, they can be co-located at one node. But if overlaps become adversarial, obviously you end up doing a lot of distributed transactions. I am moving some of the ownership to a single node. That is why I want the groups to be small, so that I can serve them from a single node. And in addition, because I am paying a cost upfront for doing the movement, that is why I want a non-trivial number of transactions to execute, so that I can amortize the cost over the, over the execution of these transactions. I have again made my life easier by putting things together at one node, so transaction becomes easier. But what I have done is I have added a dynamics to the system that this handshake between the followers and the leaders now have to be guaranteed to have correctness in the presence of the different types of failures that can happen. So that's a distributed transaction? Uh, just one transaction, one. One. yes. Okay. That's similar to a distributed transaction. So essentially what we do is we form, a, we execute what we call a group formation protocol, which is similar to a distributed transaction to do this in a fault tolerant way. Now as I have said, what are the challenges? The, the challenge here is to guarantee the con that the contract between the leaders and the followers is met in the presence of both the leader as well as the followers failing, in the presence of lost duplicated or reordered messages within the network as a result of network failures arising, or in the presence of dynamics of the underlying system because you have a statically partitioned system sitting underneath that can do its own set of things in a funny ways, you still want to guarantee correctness in the presence of that. And now that I have brought things together at one node, how do I efficiently execute ACID transactions on these dynamically formed groups? So let us take one at a time. To deal with the first challenge before do the group, grouping protocol, essentially what I will give is a very high level overview of what, how we do it. So if you consider the timeline, this is how the leader's time is progressing, this is how the follower's time is progressing. At some point in time, the application comes and says, hey, I want to form a group or I want transactional access to the group, that is when the leader executes a handshake between the follower, uh, with all the followers node by exchanging these messages. Once this handshake completes, the ownership has, is at one node, so all the group operations are now local, so they are efficient. At some point in time, the application says, oh, I am done with it, I do not really care about this group anymore, so that there comes the delete request at which point there is another handshake that guarantees that the ownership is given back to the followers and the keys are free from, from a group. Now what I have abstracted here is that all of these messages can fail here, messages can be lost. So essentially we use mechanisms for timers, retransmissions as well to, to deal with failed messages. What might also happen is messages can get reordered or duplicated or be delivered after a long period of time. So we use a concept of per group epochs to deal, detect stale or reordered messages. I am not getting into the details of these, the paper has all the details. In addition, these nodes can fail as well. So what you have, might have noticed here is that we have a bunch of logging operations that are happening for all the group, uh, group operations of the messages being exchanged. 
So this is the log at both the leader and the follower that persistently stores the group information as well as allows us to recreate the group information after a failure. So what I can do is that if somewhere here the group node fails, I don't terminate the group formation. It kind of resumes after failure. Yes, a crash failure, not a malicious one. No, well, there's a permanent failure. Yeah, there is a permanent failure as well. So in that case, the log has to be persisted across a failure. So what I realize is a failure where the log can, uh, I still have access to log. So one idea is to replicate the log itself by putting it in a replicated storage. So that way it, uh, you can deal with single node failures and still have log. So for folks who are uh, familiar with database architecture, so this is conceptually similar to locking. The difference here is that instead of locks being held by a transaction, now the locks are being held by the group during the lifetime of the group. Now, how do I efficiently execute transactions? Now, once everything is at one node, essentially this boils down to an architecture something like this, that every node has a transaction manager that deals, executes transactions on the group. And there is, because the leader has unique access to the data items, I can aggressively cache the data items at the leader. So there is a cache manager that caches all the data, answering Ravi's question, that it's just the cache of the data. The actual data is here with the followers. And all the transaction updates are local to the cache. So how do I guarantee persistence of these updates? I use a log at the transaction manager that logs all the transactional updates so that I can deal with failures of the transaction manager as well and recover from the log. So the cache is asynchronously propagated to the followers so that the followers eventually get all the updates. And there is a guarantee that before a group is deleted, all updates have propagated to the group. So this way, what you have done is that by paying the cost of one distributed transaction at the start of the group, the rest of your life becomes easy and efficient. So essentially, you amortize or after executing a few transactions, you kind of break even and start getting the profits. In terms of implementation, how can we implement it? So as a proof of concept, I implemented it on top of a key value store. I chose HBase, which is an open source variant of Bigtable. So here what we have is the key value store logic that is executing on a cluster of servers. And what I add is I added a grouping middleware on top of it that has a grouping layer that executes the group formation and deletion as well as a transaction manager that executes transactions on the group. And to answer your question, you can put the log in the distributed storage. So this allows the log uh, to be persistent across failure of individual nodes. So how did we do in terms of performance? So our evaluation was done, again, uh, using this prototype implementation, which is about like 10,000 lines of code added in the middleware layer. And we, I experimented using Amazon EC2 to do some scale out uh, experiments. I did an online benchmark, uh, a benchmark which is an online multiplayer game. And on a cluster of a modest cluster of 10 nodes, we were able to serve about a billion rows, which is about a terabyte of data. And with groups of the size of 100 keys, the group creation latency was somewhere between 10 to 100 milliseconds, depending on how you select the groups and how you are doing. And in this cluster of 10 nodes, you are able to serve about 10,000 nodes on uh, 10,000 groups being concurrently served on this cluster. Obviously, this is just a snapshot of the experiment. The paper gets into details of how the numbers vary on uh, the different parameters. And this is just a view of the same set of experiments, which shows that depending on how you choose, how you end up implementing, implementing the middleware layer, you can implement it within the key value store or sitting outside the key value store. And depending on two dist different distributions of key selection, how does the group creation latency and the group creation throughput vary? So as you can see, this is a distribution which allows where keys are contiguous. So my implementation can efficiently batch the group formation to give you very low cost group formation. While if you come up with an adversarial distribution, it can obviously get uh, worse. Now, I've shown you a mechanism of executing transactions, and I've briefly discussed about a mechanism that allows you to execute transactions in a scale-out setting. Uh -huh. yeah. 
So, uh, did you compare with uh, just ground robin partitioning or hash partitioning? So, this is uh, range partitioning here. So, in terms of transactions per second, how much how how much better are you? So, very that technique. Yeah. So, the thing is that. We don't have an experimental evaluation for that. We are currently working on the because there is no distributed transaction implementation on HBase. So I'm currently implementing on that. But the idea here is that the back of the envelope calculation is that if you are after you have formed the group, you have done two or three transactions, you have broken even because now you have already uh, broken even for the cost of group formation, and now anything you do is profit for you. That's back of envelope, but actually it might vary. Because the group formation is essentially like running a transaction. One distributed you're transaction. One, you're paying for one distributed transaction and then you're you're that it's your level. level. Yeah, so actually two, one for formation and one for deletion. Yeah. So the uh, deciding when to form a group and the size of the group, you're expecting the application to uh, handle all these for you? Yeah, in the current work, yes. But in the future, we would like to try to automate it based on some workload patterns or uh, using some form of exposing higher level semantics so that the applications can do it declaratively. But in the current setting, yes. Yeah. So, so do you rely on shared storage for this? Uh, no, we don't. But uh, this implementation happened to use that. But we don't have anything in the shared storage. So what, uh, except for the log for high availability. But what the, uh, the key idea here is that what we are doing is we are decoupling the transaction execution from the actual data storage and allowing you to do a lightweight reorganization. You can view it as being a shared storage because the underlying storage itself is shared across multiple groups, but nothing inherent. Yeah. If groups overlap, do you still see performance benefits compared to not using groups at all? If the group overlaps are small, then yes. So you can stick multiple groups together at one node. But if they overlap like uh, arbitrarily, then obviously this is not a good solution. Probably you need something different. OK. So now, assuming that we can execute transactions somehow, two different approaches are shown. How do you make the design elastic so that we have the property which we wanted to have? So what exactly does elasticity mean in the database tier? I'll give a very high level motivating example. So let's take a simplified view of the world. There is a class of, there is a set of application clients that are accessing the service through a load balancer. And there is a tier of application on the web server and the database is sitting uh, at the bottom. In this I'll consider the, I'll motivate this from more from the multi-tenancy aspect, but it can be applied to the database partitioning based approach as well. I use a color coding where the clients have a color corresponding to their database partition here, or the tenants, uh, tenants are color coded. Now, I put this, I design this application, put it up on Facebook, it becomes extremely popular. One of my applications become extremely popular and there is a surge in load. So if this infrastructure was deployed on a cloud, what I can do is the application server tier can easily scale out because very little state is being shared across them. I would want the same property within the database, which is currently not, pro typically not provided, is that you would want to add a new node to the system, migrate over parts of the database, in this case the tenant's database, so that you can redistribute the load or balance the load across the different set of servers. I would also want to do the reverse process that when the load decreases, I would want to have the ability to consolidate back as well. This consolidation is critical to optimize the operating cost in a paper use infrastructure. So as you have said, seen, essentially, elasticity in the database tier boils down to migrating a database partition or tenant, if you may, in a live system without any introducing any downtime. This allows you to optimize the operating cost, as I've said, as well as in a multi-tenant system where multiple tenants are sharing resources between the, of the system resources, this is an effective tool to do online resource orchestration on demand as the resource requirements change. Obviously, as you can see, migration is a loaded term because migration can also be used for as the database software evolves, how do you migrate data between the different softwares? Or how, how do you migrate data as the, data schema, as the database schema evolves? So the use of my term of migration in this setting is primarily for elasticity and is different from these contexts. So one of the simple solutions or one of the straightforward solutions which people can easily come up with is, why don't you use VM migration for database elasticity? 
So how can we do it? One of the approaches is to have every tenant give its own database running within a VM, and then there is a hypervisor that shares these VMs at a, different, at, at a single node. This is a valid design supported by the current state of the art, and you can now use VM migration to migrate things on the fly. However, as you have seen, and as many of you know, the databases weren't designed for this kind of operation. And if you're running multiple databases uncoordinated at the same node, God be with you in terms of performance. And there is a recent paper that shows you that the performance overhead can be as much as an order of magnitude, both in terms of performance as well as the consolidation ratio. So what you would want is you would want multiple different database partitions to be resident within a same database process. So that gives you somewhat better performance. Even I would, I, in my life, I wouldn't want it, the VM to be sitting here as well. But let us consider it for this scenario. Now you can use the VM to migrate the database again, but now what you have lost out is that you have lost out the ability to do fine-grained load balancing. Was that a question? Oh, okay. So what you would ideally want is this world where you have only the database process running on bare metal, a bunch of tenants or database partitions sharing the same database process, and a, a model which is called shared process multi-tenancy in the database literature, and you would want to migrate individual partitions on demand in a live system. So what I'm essentially saying is that what VMs allow you to do for our operating systems, I'm, I'm going to allow you to do the same functionality in the database tier. So essentially what you can view this to being virtualization in the database tier itself. Again, there is another straightforward solution that can be done because databases were designed to be fault tolerant. So essentially what you can do is that you can stop the database at the, uh, at the source, migrate it over to the destination, and then start serving it as a destination. I call it the stop and copy technique. And again, this, is, can, this can be done. However, it is expensive. Why is it expensive? Because it results in an unavailability window. And I want to have minimal unavailability during migration. If possible, no unavailability. I want to minimize this metric. In addition, I want to also minimize any impact on the tenant while I'm doing migration. Migration is done for system management. The tenant should not be aware of it. So I want to minimize the number of failed requests as well as have minimal impact on the performance of the transactions that are executing. And in addition, from the system's perspective, I also want to minimize the amount of data that is transferred as a result of migration. There is some amount of data that needs to be migrated. In that this is the data on top of that. So essentially, what I've, as I've said, there are two different approaches of, uh, in which databases are designed. One approach, which we call the decoupled storage, where the transaction execution logic is decoupled from the storage logic. There are popular examples, like different examples, like the system Illustras, which I designed. GStore happens to be a similar uh, design as well. Project Deuteronomy at Microsoft Research, as well as Google Megastore form into this category. Now, because your persistent data is stored in a network attached storage while you're migrating, you don't need to migrate the data. So essentially, now it boils down to migrating the execution state of the database, migrate the transactions, as well as migrate the database cache. And I propose this technique, Illustras, as well as implemented it on top of, uh, so I propose this technique, Albatross, which is implemented on top of Illustras. And this is a paper that would be presented in the upcoming VLDB in a couple of weeks. There is also another way of designing databases, which is the standard shared nothing design, where the persistent data is stored in locally attached uh, storage. Here, when you're migrating, it's a harder problem, because now you have to move the large amounts of data as well. So how do you guarantee that you, do, you incur minimal cost during such migration? So uh, the common examples of this architecture are SQL Azure, Relational Cloud, which is again the M prototype from MIT, and MySQL also has a cluster offering, which is a similar shared nothing cluster. And we, I proposed a technique called Zephyr, which was presented recently in Sigmod in June. In this talk, I'll just focus on Zephyr. You are welcome to come to VLDB to get into the details of. Uh, so just a comment. So the shared nothing architectures, if you take SQL Azure, for example, they already have certain availability guarantees, and for that, they already replicate the data, right? Yeah. Uh, not necessary that you need to move large amounts. Yes, of that's a very good point. And we can, as I'll show, we leverage from the le replication. But when you are doing elasticity, you don't always have. Uh, you are trying to add a new node, and you don't have always have a replica running at that node. So I want a technique that allows you to replicate migrate even in that setting. But 
yeah, as, I, as you said, replication can be benefited. So why is this a hard problem? I've already said that multiple times, so let's get into the details of the actual points. We, we want to migrate the persistent database image or the uh, persistent image of the data which can be of the order of gigabytes. So how do you guarantee no downtime while you are migrating such large amounts of data? So you have to execute transactions while the data is being migrated. Now because it's not an instantaneous process, again there can be failures. Nodes can fail during migration, both the source and the destination. So how do you guarantee correctness in the presence of failures? Especially transaction atomicity and durability, how do you guarantee that the transactions executing have the properties? As well as you want to recover the state of migration if there is a failure in the middle, so that you don't leave the system in an inconsistent state. In addition, because you don't want any uh, downtime, transactions would be executing during migration. So how do you guarantee serializability of these transactions while you are migrating things on the fly? So that from the tenant's perspective, it is normal business, from, uh, as if nothing happened. So what our approach is, what the way we do it is that instead of viewing as migration as one chunk being migrated, we break down migration into a collection of phases. It starts with, migration starts with transfer of minimal information from the source to the destination. We call this the wireframe. The minimal information consists of the database schema, user authentication information, and another thing called the index wireframe, which I'll get into. Again, instead of viewing the entire database to be migrated as a whole, we view a database as a collection of pages, a database pages, which is often the case. And we use the concept of unique page level of ownership and migration of database pages on demand from the source to the destination. To allow for zero downtime, there is a phase in migration where we allow for the, both the source and the destination to concurrently execute transaction on, on it. And we show that how you can you have minimal transaction synchronization and still guarantee serializability for such transactions. And we use mechanisms for logging and handshaking to guarantee fault tolerance of uh, the different uh, fault tolerance as a, uh, during the migration as well. So in this talk, I'll make some simplifying assumption to limit the scope. I'll assume that transactions execute at a single node. I do not leverage from replication in, for this technique, but I can definitely do that. The paper shows you how to do that. And I would assume that there are some indices that are used to keep track of pages. I don't allow any structural changes to the indices during migration. The paper obviously gives up all these assumptions and gives an extended design that is more flexible compared to what I'll present in this presentation, in this talk. Question. Yeah. What do you mean by structural change? If I have a B3 and I do an update, I'll, it's not allowed? I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. There are ways of, of, of um, doing a replication uh, which doesn't take the replica, the the uh, original source offline while you're doing the replica, uh, which allows you to sort of scan the replica, copy the replica, co copy the data, and then and then use the log to bring it up to date. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which greatly shortens or perhaps eliminates the the the, 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 the service interruption uh, mm -hmm. for that. It, uh, you seem to paint you painted the picture before of the of the, doing the replication. Yes, yes, that was kind of a, awful when, yeah. when you're it's, it's not, it's not, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. The reason why we don't use it here is there are two, two reasons. One of it is that for setting up a new replica, you incur a lot of checkpointing overhead. That is a lot of disk IO. And if there is, the source is already overloaded, you don't want to add load to the source. And the second is that, as you will see here, the destination starts executing transactions as soon as you start migration. So you are able to offload some of the load to the destination immediately. So that allows you to uh, a better performance. But obviously, the exact numbers would vary depending on uh, workloads. So my view of the database is a collection of pages. There are a set of active transactions that are executing, and there is an index that keeps track of these, how, what exactly is in the pages. I'll use this index to tag along additional information, which, is called, which I call as the page ownership information. If a page is, at the, the convention I'll use in this talk is that if a page is white, which means this is the node that owns the page or has unique read-write access to the page. And if it's grayed out, the node has information about the page but doesn't have the data. When migration starts, 
you freeze the index wireframe. I will get into what do you mean by freezing and migrate over the index wireframe. So, what exactly is an index wireframe? Just to take a specific case of a B plus tree index, your index wireframe is the internal nodes of the B plus tree index and your actual data resides on the database pages. What I mean by freezing the index is I would not allow any structural changes to the metadata. So, I still allow updates to these individual pages, but if there is an update or an insert that results in a new page to be inserted, which is then a change in this index wireframe, that is something that is not allowed during migration. So, it will be blocked? Uh, it will be aborted in this setting, but there are simple extensions that can be done again to deal with that problem. So, essentially when I move the mig migrate the index wireframe, this is what the destination has. It has information that oh, there are some database pages, but it does not have the database pages. So, this is the state of the destination in what we call the dual mode. At, in this mode, the just make sure I understood that. So you're basically saying no page splits. No you? page splits during migration. During migration. So you yes. do inserts, but as soon as you hit the page limit, you got to yeah. work that transaction. Yes, that's right. Would, would using a B link tree permit you to relax that requirement? Yes, it does. And you can also use overflow buckets which are similar to B link trees. Okay, so at the destination, at the start of the dual mode, it just has the meta information. At this point, I allow new transactions to go to the destination. And while the source is still completing transactions that are still active or that are arriving due to stale metadata at the routing layer. Now, because the transactions start executing at the destination without the data, now the data is pulled in on demand, leveraging the index structure to keep track of ownership information. So, let us take for example that page P3 is being accessed by a transaction at the destination. At this point, the request is sent to the source and the sense uh, the source does some synchronization at this point to ensure that there is this page p3 is not currently being accessed by any other transaction and if that is true it changes the ownership information and migrates the page over to the destination so this is the only point in time where the two nodes synchronize when executing transactions when uh, and the concept of unique page ownership allows us in uh, using this mechanism now, as soon as the source completes all the transactions, now it just keeps, figures out what are the pages that have still not been migrated and then asynchronously pushes them to the destination and destination keeps getting on the information. But again, since transactions are access, executing at the destination, pages can still be pulled on demand and we show how the index metadata can be used to detect duplicates in this setting and guarantee that you do not mess up the database state. And once all the page structures, uh, all the pages have been migrated, now the source can get rid of all the resources. The paper again shows how to get rid of the log logs as well, so that the source is completely free now and everything, the destination is the sole owner. Now, because of the simplification which I did for the sake of the talk, there are, these are the following artifacts of this simplification. That I migrate pages only once. Once a page is migrated from the source to the destination, it is never pulled back. This allows for forward progress and quick migration. But what it, what it allows, what it, the implication is that any transaction that accesses a page that has been migrated from the source must be aborted. Remember here accesses because I want to give serializability. If I, if I can give snapshot isolation, then I can allow reads. As I have said, no structural changes to the index. So, any transaction at both the source and the destination, if it results in a structural change to the index, that would be aborted as well. And because the destination pulls the pages on demand from the source, there is a higher latency for some of the transactions that are going to the destination. In most of the times, it is pulling from the source's cache, so it is not such a big latency, but there is somewhat higher latency because of the network traffic. Why do you need, why do you need that? Why do you need no structure changes? I mean, if, if, if you're executing transactions at the destination and you have a page split, so what? I, I don't need that. I, the, this is just for simplicity to allow for merging the indices easier. In the paper, we actually talk about an extension that where we don't need that. Actually, we don't need that. So, I think I'm probably running short on time. So, I'll just keep on some of the serializability. It's okay. Okay. So, essentially what I have done is that I have just used a simple synchronization mechanism. So, how am I going to do guarantee serializability? 
during transaction execution. As you can see, the dual mode is the only concern because only only in the dual mode, the two uh, the two nodes are executing transactions concurrently. What in the paper we show is that you can use local predicate locking at the index level and exclusive page ownership at the leaf level to ensure that there are no phantoms during migration. We use trick two-phase locking during normal tra transaction execution so to guarantee that transactions are not lo uh, transactions are locally serializable. And because we use this only once transaction uh, database page migration, essentially what you can see is show is that any transaction at the destination is ordered after a conflicting transaction at the source. So there is a strict ordering that is enforced. So this allows you to prevent loops in your serializes, serialization graphs. Those are providing you guaranteed serializability. Now, recovery becomes complicated as well because now two, transactions, two nodes are executing transactions concurrently. But again, I use this causal ordering property between the pages that if there are two transactions that are conflicting on a page, I just want strict ordering on them. I don't care about other transactions. So when I'm moving pages over from the source to the destination, I also carry over the log sequence number so that all transactions at the destination are ordered after the source, even in the recovery log. And during recovery, you just replay maintaining this order. So you are preserving the conflict order during recovery as well. And how do you recover? So this was transaction recovery, by the way. How do you ensure migration recovery? You have to guarantee that because the there are two nodes changing between different states, you have to guarantee that they are always in the same state and there is no confusion on that. In the paper, we show how, at, uh, how you can atomically transition from one stage of migration or one phase of migration to another phase of migration. And essentially, we use logging and handshake protocols for doing this atomic transition. And in addition, every page always has a unique owner in the node. And you can use bookkeeping in the index level to keep track of this ownership information even after a failure. So in a simple way, you would always log a uh, migration of a page, but that introduces a lot of I.O. as well. So in the paper, we show how you can rely on the transaction semantics to capture this migration information and make it persistent and be able to recover that as well. So essentially, what we show is that in the presence of arbitrary uh, repeated failures, we can guarantee updates made to a database page are consistent. Failures do not leave a page without an owner, and the, both the source and the destination are in the same migration mode. So you can, uh, essentially this extends to the uh, correctness proof. And we also show how you can guarantee termination and starvation freedom in the presence of arbitrary failures as well. So, so why isn't this simply a, a special case of a data sharing system? Actually, the, it is. Uh, and the extension, which I didn't talk about, relies on data sharing and uh, global and local lock managers to exchange the pages. But uh, yeah, so this, is, this becomes a data sharing only during migration. So in terms of implementation, the, all this, uh, all the design was implemented in, ta in an open source OLTP database called H2, which provides all the bells and whistles of a uh, classical OLTP database. And to implement this, we went and added support for freezing the indices as well as keeping track of ownership information. This was about 6,000 lines of code hacked in the database engine. We used an open source router, SQL router, to migrate connections from the source to the destination as a result of migration. How did we do in terms of performance? We evaluated it using, a, using an open source micro benchmark. We adapted the Yahoo cloud serving benchmark to add transactions and vary the different parameters of the workload. Depending on the database size or the workload which is executing, the vanilla technique, which is stop and copy, allows you results in three to eight seconds where a database is unavailable. This is for a very small database, about like 200 megabytes or something. As you make the database bigger, this unavailability window becomes longer and longer. What you have to note is that during this period, you can only run the database in read-only mode. So any update transaction has to, be, has to abort during migration. On the other hand, Zephyr does not result in any downtime because at any point in time, either the source or the destination is executing transactions. In terms of the failed operations, 
Because stop and copy has to fail all updates, it results in about hundreds to thousands of operations failing during migration. Again, depending on the workload, these numbers vary. On the other hand, Zephyr results in, and the simple prototype of Zephyr results in an orders of magnitude fewer failed operations. And in the paper, we show how you can guarantee zero transaction loss, but we don't have an implementation for that yet. So even, even the simple implementation is orders of magnitude better in that setting. So the failures, because of uh, the inserts, so we run a war adversarial workload with all, a lot of inserts, and uh, whenever there is a change in the index structure, that results in a failure. Also, though, some transactions may just get sent to the wrong machine. Uh, at the source, yes, but, but the source, as long as the store source is still active, it can still serve those transactions. But if they get, I see. So yeah. the abort of the transaction and then redirecting to the target is not considered a, fa a failed transaction. Uh, no, in this number. No. Okay. So uh, what the transaction requires two pages. One is at the source, other has been migrated. Uh -huh. So will that transaction? No, that transaction will fail. At the will source. fail. So you won't yeah. do a distributed. No, I won't do. So the uh, overall across my work, the idea is to avoid distributed transactions wherever possible. But uh, there is an extension that does that actually. You use a shared lock manager for getting the pages. So what was the benchmark you ran for? So I, I, this is a Yahoo cloud serving benchmark with modified support for transactions, multi-table operations, and client sessions. So Yahoo cloud serving benchmark was a key value store, benchmark for key value stores, which obviously doesn't have any transactions. So, so, so you know, could you characterize what fraction of the transactions had multi-page uh, required multi-page access and things. Every transaction required a multi-page access. And every transaction was multi-operation. Default was 10. You can vary uh, number of operations within a transaction. We also looked at like 25, 30 operation transactions as well. So all of these parameters were varied during the experiments. So if you do stop and copy, you can do an IO efficient copy, right? You can just yes. do a disk order copy. Yeah. Well, your thing is going gonna, is gonna to pull pages on demand. So yeah, so essentially. Huge. In theory, yes, but in practice, we didn't observe that because what happens is that most of the pages that are accessed at the destination during the pull phase are often in the cache, just the reason for locality. And then the final phase is just a copy through the disk. So in theory, it can be bad, but not in, not in practice for our, at least the workloads we did. So in terms of operational overhead, we show that the operational overhead resulting in the, the as a result of this migration is very low of the order between 10 to 15 percent increased latency during migration. So this is a number, a graph that shows you how the number of failed operations increase as you increase the load. Yeah. Regarding the operational overhead, mm -hmm. so if you actually take about uh, the multi-tenancy kind of system, mm -hmm. the system is already loaded because you know mm -hmm. you are actually trying to uh, scale out. Mm -hmm. So I think. Uh, so I think from that context, uh, any increase in the operational overhead, I mean, the time of the migration is kind of very critical. So have you done any comparative studies? Like so the thing is that I agree to it, but if you wouldn't have migrated, you would do worse because your source is already overloaded. So that's the argument against it. And that is one of the reasons why you used, we, this, we use this technique that immediately you offload the load to the destination and the destination starts catching up. And whatever load you do is just for fetching the pages on demand. But yeah. if the source is already overloaded, mm -hmm. the source takes care of the, of the migration. Because if you have a lot of requests of page from, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the destination, yeah. then you are too overloaded to fulfill that stream. Yes, so the, uh, that's, a, that's a good point as well. So the idea here is that I haven't talked about the controller level. So the, there is a controller that is sitting on top of these things. So it is the responsibility of the controller to start migration at least when, is there, when there is some room left to migrate. If it's already too late, you are 100% overloaded, tough luck. There is, there is, you have already screwed up your system. There is none, uh, migration wouldn't help you. So typically, like, uh, when you're getting close to uh, being overbooked, that's when you initiate migration. That's part of the controller's responsibility. But as I said, that it's a very low overhead on the source. It's just fetching pages and not executing the transactions. If, if it were executing transactions, it would have been even more in a mess state. So in terms of failed operations here, as you are increasing the load on the system, 
as you can see the stop and copy technique the rate of increase is much higher for compared to the Zephyr technique not only is this an order of magnitude better the rate of increase is also much higher so just to give you an example the slope of the Zephyr curve is 0.48 whereas that for stop and copy is 8.4 which shows that it, it uh, this uh, technique is more robust to deal with uh, different variations of the load and allows you to do migration even when the load has is higher on the source. If you change the client side library, so that during migration, the client, instead of a body expansion, mm -hmm. probably call, mm -hmm. and then after the migration is done, we direct to the mm -hmm. destination side. I believe the figure will be much, much more. Yeah, that is true as well. But then they also will have an impact on the latency of the executing transactions as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the, you still have to abort transactions that are active. At the source. I don't understand what you just told me about. So this is a slope of a line. If you fit a line here on the graph as well as on this graph, so this is the slope of that so trend line. You that the slope of the line across the tops of those yellow bars is 8.4. Yes. It's like when you double the number of transactions, you less than double the height. Yeah. That seems to me to be a slope less than one on 8.4. So the uh, less than one is. Uh, uh, so this is basically the uh, slope measure for. Uh, okay. So this is the slope measure of the angle which is being projected here in, in radians. Okay, now I don't understand what okay, so the thing is that what... Sorry, no, I'm sorry. It is, uh, sorry, sorry, I messed it up. It's, uh, it's uh, let me remember. I think it is the, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact measure, but I think it's either the angle or the tangent of the angle which is reported here. But I, I can look back into the paper and Run. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's really hard to read that from the graph because. The yeah, graph that's what. That's why we <laughs> added this information into this graph itself. Yeah, except I don't understand that information. So I'll have to uh, uh, get back to the paper to figure out what is uh, what is the exact measure we did. I mean, you're an order of magnitude better. So yeah. No. So this, you see that the increase is much lower here compared to the increase which is here. So this is the angle of the line which is drawn, uh, a trend line. <laughs> I don't know, it looks like it's about... The okay, I should have uh, probably had a pen line. It's hard, right. it's hard, to, read, it's hard yeah. to read the Zephyr one, but the, you know, the stop and copy, it's going from 600 to 1,000 over um, a spread of yeah. 40 transactions per second, so it's, you know... You double the number of transactions and you less than double the number of failed transactions, so that's a slope less than one yeah. on, on my plan. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, yeah. Like that. Okay. I think it's just like 600 over 40 is what So, stepping back in terms of the overall vision, we, want, we started off with a system where we wanted to have scale out while by, uh, executing transactions. We wanted to have elasticity as well while executing transactions. So, my dissertation proposes major enabling technologies to solve these specific challenges. Specifically, I propose a design for a scalable distributed data, database infrastructure. This is one of the first few uh, techniques. There are a bunch of things that were also designed concurrently, but this is also one of the first few techniques in this area. I've shown how to execute transactions efficiently for partitions that are dynamically formed. And this is, again, uh, the only technique which I know of that has been published that allows that. And I've also shown two different, I've also shown two different techniques to allow for live database migration or lightweight elasticity. Again, to the best of my knowledge, this, these are the only two published solutions. I know there are some things that are cooking, but they haven't been published yet from the other groups as well. And what I would also like to point out is that all of these designs designs were implemented uh, in real systems as well as evaluated to show effectiveness. In terms of related work, I've already covered most of it scattered throughout the presentation. In, for transactions and scale out, I leverage from a lot of work over the last 30, uh, 30 years or so, which I didn't put up here. In terms of the systems that are being concurrently developed is the Cloud SQL Server, which was from Microsoft, Megastore, Deuteronomy, Relational Cloud, Percolator was a system from Google which is, forms the basis for their new index, indexing mechanism. And this is a system that does distributed transactions, actually. But it's a different application domain, not high-performance transactions. 
and obviously we have uh, HIDAR as well from Microsoft Research. And again, the list is also, uh, this is an incomplete list, just a snapshot. In terms of elasticity and migration, we just have VM migration, which is currently known, nothing published, uh, nothing in the published literature. In terms of future directions, again, the space is very rich, and this is definitely not uh, the end of the story. I've tried to list some of the problems which I have the background and I feel are relevant in the next few, uh, in the upcoming years is, I, I just scratched on the surface for a self-managing controller for multi-tenant system. And I believe it's a very important area to uh, pursue, given that there is enough scope there where you have a large distributed system, you have no idea what it's doing, trying to get a good understanding of it and trying to automate the management of such system, such as placement of tenants, resource orchestration, online profiling, and how would you, you would update your models online as well. This is a very important area of research which I, I want to pursue as well. Another is novel data management architectures. On one end, we have the hardware, which is continuously improving. We have phase change memories coming in. We have FPGAs. We, can, we have GPUs. How can we build in, uh, bring this hardware into the database architecture and come up with more efficient implementations or more efficient database architectures. And another thing which I want, also want to point out is the, is the need for convergence of transaction systems and analysis systems. Not our warehouse, but just the ability to provide real-time intelligence in a system that is getting all the updates. This is extremely critical for a lot of the applications that are coming in, where as soon as you see an, a change in the behavior or a change in an update, you want to react fast in real time. So this is something which I, what are the right architectures in this model? And how can you build this such architectures? This is another area of, uh, area of interest for me. And another thing which has getting a lot of popularity is what we call crowdsourcing or putting the human in the loop. I don't want to propose new crowdsourcing solutions, but for a lot of these problems, I can leverage what, uh, a lot of crowdsourcing solutions as well. For example, when we are Dealing with convergence of multiple sources of data, entity resolution becomes a big uh, issue. Data integration also becomes a big issue. How can we leverage cheap human labor to solve some of these hard problems which we encountered in these systems to help us out in solving some of these hard problems? So this brings us to the end of my talk. I'd like to thank you, everyone, for attending this talk. And I'd also like to thank all my collaborators. I've had the wonderful fortune to collaborate with a, lot, a large number of uh, great researchers, and specifically thank my advisors, Divya Agrawal and Amar Alabadi, without whose contribution I wouldn't be standing here. And I'd like to open it up for more questions. Compared to the old uh, traditional migration solution, mm -hmm. it's just working at a different uh, granularity. It's like working at the page level. Mm -hmm. right. it, it also means that it requires that both the destination and the source have the same physical data structure. Yes, that is correct. Uh, also means that it has more complication. You haven't considered about the uh, schema changes, uh, uh, they, they no, they definitely should, not. If you consider all those factors, yeah. it will get yeah. much more complicated. Yeah, yeah. So I agree to that. And this is one of the disclaimers I put up front that I'm not considering it for this paper. Uh, Microsoft has some solutions on this block shipping, DB mirroring, mm -hmm. uh, drop. It's working at a database level. Mm -hmm. It's already very, very complicated. Yeah. Yeah, it obviously, if you, the more features you want to pro uh, propose, that it definitely increases the complexity as well. Yeah. I don't know if it, whether it was a question or a comment. I, I, I agree to your comment. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I agree to it. Right. Because uh, there's a quite smart of a complexity. Yes, so the thing is that what we were trying to solve is we are trying to solve more of a research question as how do you guarantee no downtime? The log shipping protocols actually results in some period of unavailability. So actually, if I didn't talk about Albatross, that uses a variant of this log shipping protocol to migrate your database cache, as well as the state of active transactions as well. This is just a migration scenario, though, not a replication scenario. If you're thinking, when you start talking about, data, you know, about database mirroring, now you can't 
just blithely say there's going to be no schema changes or no other structural changes because you're going to be running this for a long period. Here, he's only doing the migration for a relatively short period to shut down schema modifications during migration seems like it would be um, not, a, not, a big, not, not a big inconvenience. In my group, yes, schema change is, is one factor. The other is about the index, indexes. Or even because one transaction is not just touching one day and one each page, it may touch many other other pages. Yeah, yeah. And we uh, have dependency on those. We still pages. we still support those kind of transactions. The thing is that only during, as Phil pointed out, only during the short duration of migration, some of these operations become expensive. And I, the claim here is that you pay a cost in terms of latency, but you don't incur any unavailability. And uh, that is what. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Did you check how much will be the difference between that play to see and not be available? Because sometimes we'll be back to say, hold on, guys, mm -hmm. now I split, mm -hmm. now you come back again to me. Mm -hmm. How much is this difference? Because if your queries are coming in and I do request a page and then you go to get the page to the source and mm -hmm. get back, if you fetch everything in once, the next queries that come, the, the data is already there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I have all the time I have to request that they can request it's, like a it's, it's not all the time it's just for the window and what i'm trying to say is some of the experiments i've shown it's of the order of few seconds that's the window while the source is finishing up their active transactions and the destination has started executing transactions i'm not running in this mode forever for the rest of my life it's just for the small window the benefit here is that obviously i can definitely add keep on adding features but that complicates the design. I wanted to show that using a very simple design, you can still guarantee a bunch of properties. So that was the main thing which we wanted to show here. And the period of restriction which we involve is also very short, of the order of even milliseconds for some of the cases. I've just given one snapshot of the total migration time. I didn't quite get actually how the indexes are transferred in the migration. So you are actually trying to uh, transfer the uh, logical structure of the yes. index. Yes. Yeah. Then when you are inserting the page, uh -huh. uh, how are you inserting? I mean, in, in the index. So the index, the way it is, the wireframe copy is that you take an intention lock on the root of the index, and that kind of prevents or any update locks being taken, in, uh, any changes being done in the in internal nodes. But the index wireframe is still there at both the source and the destination. Whenever there is an insert at the source or the destination, it goes through all the index structures and figures out what is the page the actual in insert would be. If it figures out that there is a, going to be a page split, that is where it's supported. If the page insert can get into the page, it's allowed. So basically, I mean, if I understand correctly, uh, you are trying to recreate the index at the order of each page. Uh, which, which I feel is very much overhead, right, in terms of performance. Because at the, at, at the destination, you're trying to insert one page, and you're actually trying to recreate your index at every time. I'm not recreating my index. It is just copied once, once at, a, at the start of migration. And the rest is just, the freezing of index is mainly to make my bookkeeping easier. I can allow changes to the index, but then merging with the index of the source and destination becomes expensive. So this is a trade-off, more of a design trade-off rather than a performance thing or something limiting, which I would say. Yep. So the, uh, you focus on transactional uh, workloads for the migration. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about uh, long-running queries? That's a very good question. That I, I think I haven't tried. That's the short answer. But it's it's harder for that because... It's easy. You just board. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. The thing is that a lot of transactional workloads often fit in memory. So you, you are not, when you are fetching pages from the destination, most of the times it happens to be in memory. But with OLAP or other analytics queries, it's often like a lot of scans. So that further increases the overhead of migration. But def definitely that's an area of future work. I mean, it's an important area as well because you want to have diversity as well. Okay. Yeah.